Okay, I think, think we're starting. <laughs> okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the 2023 Minoru Yasui Day program, Behind These Bars, An Activist is Born. Presented by the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project in the Japanese American U Museum of Oregon. My name is Kristen DeZono and I will be your MC today. Today's program highlights Minoru Yasui's cross-cultural work and lifelong advocacy and justice for all. We will hear from a panel on men's relevancy and call to action across generations. And perhaps most of all, we are excited to have you join us for the official dedication of men's historic jail cell. The goal of today is to continue the legacy of men in Hali Yasui, to fight racism and discrimination as individuals with groups in your community or with others at the national level. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge and honor the original people of the land that the city of Portland and Multnomah County now rest upon. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Tualatin Kalapuya, Wasco, Malala, Cowlitz, and Watlata bands of Chinook, and the many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We want to thank them for their stewardship of this land as we stand as allies in the continued fight for the health and sovereignty of the land. Today's program would not be possible without the wonderful support from support supporters and donors. So at this time, we'd like to acknowledge our major sponsors for today's program, our Pillars of Justice. ACLU Oregon, Laura's Fond, Fund, Gorge Community Foundation, Meyer Memorial Trust, Northwest Natural, Oregon Historical Society, University of Oregon Division of Equity and Inclusion, the families of Masuo and Shizuo Yasui, the CHOP Yasui Fund Gorge Community Foundation. We'd also like to recognize and thank Bill and Marie Waterman, who are the primary donors of the University of Oregon School of Law's Minoru Yasui Fellowship. I believe Bill's here today. Bill, could you stand and raise your hand? We also have past and present Minoru Yasui fellows joining us as well. Weston Koyama, Gabriel Naganuma, and Anna Rutan. Next, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the work of the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project Steering Committee. Janet Hamada, Weston Koyama, Lynn Fuchikami Parks, Jillian Tota Curry, Maya Yasui, and Peggy Nagai, soon to be senior advisor, Carol Suzuki, legislative sustainability advisor, Bill Waterman, U of O Law School Minoru, Minoru Yasui Fellowship Program, and Barbara Yasui, education advisor. We, uh, we also actually have a lot of people on Zoom today that are watching as well, so we'll say hello to them and thank them for joining us too. The Minoru Yasui Legacy Project, MYLP, was formed in 2014 to honor the life and legacy of Min Yasui, an advocate for justice and civil liberties for all. Their first major initiative was the successful nomination of Min for a presidential Medal of Freedom, which President Obama awarded him posthumously in 2015, in recognition of his role in challenging the Executive Order 9066, which wrongfully curtailed the rights of Japanese American citizens during World War II. Today, the MYLP focuses on engaging the public through presentations, social media, symposia, and student projects to bring attention to systemic racism, injustice and equity among disenfranchised communities and focusing on cross collaboration with diverse communities. We are thrilled to have the founder of the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project with us today. Peggy Nagai will soon be the senior advisor for MYLP and Min's lead attorney for his Quorum Nobis case. Please give a warm welcome to her now, Peggy. Thank you, Kristen. Let's see if I can get this right. I'm supposed to speak right in front of it. 
Okay, so my deep gratitude for Holly for suggesting we start the Minyasui Legacy Project and focus on two initial uh, projects, the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the documentary video that she did. I'm really grateful for our innumerable, in-depth, and energetic conversations that we've had, we had over the years. Special thanks to Maya Yasui, who, who can't be with us today because she had a knee operation, so she's streaming in. <clears throat> and Lynn Fujigami Parks and Chris Ling for our work this year, this monumental work. Uh, and also to Jillian Toda Curry, uh, Cynthia Bassey, Logan Pernard, Veda Yama for, for evolving the Minya Sui student contest. And hopefully you have somebody that will be interested in the contest. It's an, it's an art contest that Julian will talk about in just a minute. And my deep appreciation to past MYLP stalwarts, June Schumann, who's in the audience, Kimberly McCullough, Jessica Asai, who you'll be hearing from, uh, Gearhart Lessing, Mark Takiguchi, Jennifer Fang, Kyler Wong, Fiona Larson Teske and Alan Zal. So they have worked, they worked for a couple years and um, great to work with them. Min and Holly fought hard and sacrificed much for justice and equality. To them, patriotism meant speaking out against a plethora of laws that ex exclude, shut down, or further restrict our rights. In recent years, the examples abound. 400 anti-trans bills have been introduced in 44 states. 24 states banned abortions in the first six months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. 32 states have introduced at least 150 restrictive voting bills. In 2022, 44 states introduced bills or took steps that restricted teaching critical race theory, and they don't even teach critical race theory, uh, or limited how teachers discuss racism and sexism. That trend is continuing in 2023. This week, Florida's governor banned an approved advanced placement course <clears throat> on African American studies. Why are these restrictions so prolific? Some say that since the 1960s, white fear and resentment toward African Americans has been fanned and over time broadened to target Hispanic, Latinx, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and other BIPOC folks. And what's the goal? Some would say that ensuring a normative hierarchy with whiteness at the top. This goal has been increasingly open, visible, and explicit. Even with these dismal statistics, the rising tide of anti-democratic sentiment, fears of an oligarchy taking over, we can learn from men's example and act from our own. Deeply rooted integrity, principles, and values believing in the Constitution, taking the responsibility of citizenship seriously, and committing to leave the world a better place. Our willingness, yours and mine, to transform racial violence and injustice by nonviolence and decisive action externally and during, doing our own spiritual work internally. In short, to do what is right, regardless of the personal cost. Ultimately, and when our work draws to an end, we will not be judged by the results we attain, but by the quality of the struggle we maintained. Here's to all of us and to maintaining our high, high, high quality, if I can say it, high quality, deeply rooted, spirit driven, and life affirming struggle. Thank you.
Thank you, Peggy. And thank you for your ongoing efforts to keep Min's legacy alive and for your continued work with the Minoto Yasui Legacy Project. We, we honor Min's sister, Yuka Yasui Fujikura, and his only surviving sibling, Homer Yasui, respectively, as they served as honorary co-chairs of the MYLP. I'm gonna wave to Homer if he's watching because he used to give me mushrooming tips for matsutake hunting. We also recognize and honor the other co-founder of the MYLP, Min's daughter, Hala Yasui. Following in her father's footsteps, she spent her life fighting for justice and equality. Sadly, we lost her to COVID in 2021. Here to share more about Holly is the talented Chisao Hara, creative director of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. On October 31st, 2021, Holly Yasui died in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico a date that many of us know and in America as the Day of the Dead, Holly's partner and two sisters, Iris and Lori, and many friends and family all over the United States and throughout Mexico, remember Holly in our hearts and even more deeply as the passage of time goes on. Holly was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, the youngest of Min and True, Yasui's three daughters. She earned degrees from the University of Colorado and the University of Wisconsin. She studied fine arts, film, comparative literature, and communication arts, but focused her work while she was in Seattle on writing, editing, and graphic design. And after leaving Seattle, she moved to San Miguel de la Allende in 1993. She worked and volunteered for various educational and community development organizations, as well as served as a human rights observer in the Zabatista Campaneros por la Paz Peace Corps and the Center for Agricultural Development in Mexico. She lived for years at the, her Echo home in Cedesa in Dolores Hilgado. She translated and organized with women in Cedesa. So I want to shout out for our friends that are online at the Global Justice Center in uh, Miguel, San Miguel de Allende, who just showed Holly's film on Thursday. So Holly dedicated her life to her father's work, but Holly was also an activist and a warrior for justice. She was a prolific writer and um, contributed many articles, essays, book chapters, and even edits of amicus briefs filed by the, her father's behalf, she understood the importance of storytelling and sharing her father's dedication to civil and human rights and carrying on so that future generations of leaders could have an Asian American hero. In her work with Sudo for Solidarity, Holly described herself as a Sansei descendant of prisoners of the Minidoka and Amachi WRA camps, also of DOJ detention centers, including Fort Missoula, Fort Sill, Camp Livingston, and Santa Fe. Holly signed on to various amicus briefs filed since 9-11 with Association of the Quorum Nobis team on racial profiling discrimination and surveillance, guilt by association, and the Muslim band. Yasui won the Multicultural Playwright Award in Seattle in 1992 for her play called Unvanquished about her father's life. And I first met Holly when we performed her play here in Portland. And we met again when she started to work on the re kind of writing of the play and renamed the play Citizen Min. So leading up to the work to have Min awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Holly and I were able to work together on a script for a 45 minute section of Citizen Min. 
and it was to be used as a catalyst for community awareness and connections for a project we called Vision and Vigilance. And during that time, we read Citizen Men at Blaine Methodist Memorial in, in Seattle for men's 100th birthday. So we performed and organized Vision and Vigilance throughout Oregon and Ontario, Portland, and Hood River so we could spread the word about men, who he was and what he was doing and how our work today relates to everything that he had accomplished. Because of Holly and the Minori Yasui Legacy Project, it exists because of Holly. And March 28th, Minori Yasui Day in the state of Oregon and Colorado exists because of Holly's work. And the discovery of men's original cell was because of Holly's research and finding the cell. And uh, we're so proud to have that cell, and you're going to hear more about that today at the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. So we thank you, Holly. We thank you for all that you have given us, and we will continue on. Nunca de rendas, never give up. Thank you, Chisao, and thank you for bringing Holly into the forefront, especially today as we celebrate Min Yasui Day and the dedication of the jail cell. In addition to annual Min Minoru Yasui Day event, the MYLP and the Japanese American Museum of Oregon hold a student contest for middle school and high school students. Holly Yasui felt strongly about getting students involved as they are the future leaders of our world. Here to announce this year's student contest is Jillian Tota Curry, chair of the student contest committee and member of the Minyasui Legacy Project Steering Committee. Jillian. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Kristen said, I'm the co-chair of the Minori Yasui Student Contest Committee along with Cynthia Basie, who is a longtime educator, as well as a board member of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, and who has also been involved um, with the student contest since its very first year back in 2018. Holly Yasui had a vision for the contest, which was really her passion project. She wanted to bring awareness to youth about her father's legacy and use the contest as a way to interest students in becoming the next generation of leaders for justice. Since 2018, the contest has been evolving. We started out as a small essay contest and only took entries from students within Oregon. In 2020, we actually uh, evolved the contest to allow students to give poster presentations about current events. But then the pandemic hit and we had to pivot to a remote format, which we've actually been doing since then. There was a silver lining within going remotely though. It allowed us to actually open up the contest to even more students. And last year we received submissions from students in more than a dozen states across the country. We've also seen how the student contest can cultivate young leaders. We've now had three students who have participated not only within the contest, but then served on our committee to actually host the contest in, um, in next years. Two of these students are outside of Oregon, and this was made possible by the changes that we've made to the contest over the years. I'm excited to announce that we've also had another change to this year's contest, and we're going in a direction that Holly really believed in and wanted to, um, wanted to do for a while. We've changed the uh, format of the contest from an essay to an art format. This will allow us to not only reach a new group of students, but also gain new perspectives um, to our contest and to our prompt. This year's prompt for the contest is around responsibility. It asks students, what is the responsibility you have in your community? Through visual art, students will express their thoughts about the prompt and tie this back to Min's legacy of justice. The contest is open to all middle and high school students across the country, maybe even across the world. There is a junior division with a top award of $500 and a senior division uh, with a top award of $1,000.
The contest is currently open and accepting submissions through May 14th. So if you'd like to learn more about the contest and get the full details, you can visit our website at menorayasuilegacy.org slash student dash contest. And we'd really appreciate if you would all um, pass this along. The information can be shared um, on our website to anybody that you know who may be interested. We'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian, and thank you. Whoops, sorry. I know I'm a little, I'm not tall anymore for Japanese, but I used to be. Thank you, Jillian, and thank you to the Student Contest Committee for their dedication and hard work on behalf of this year's 2023 contest. Many know about Min's history and storied past here in Oregon, but many are unaware of his life work as a Colorado attorney and community relations director addressing injustice across all populations. In addition to the Asian population for which he's most well known, he advocated for the rights of Native and African Americans, Jews, Latino women, and Latinos, women, and the LGBTQ plus communities. Here to share about Min's cross-cultural work as a community leader in Denver is our special guest speaker and Min's niece, Dr. Robin Yasui. I want to thank you for having me here um, in your beautiful, sunny, Drove up from Hood River this morning in the snow and rain and wind. It was really um, beautiful, though, no matter what. This is a gorgeous place to come, and I always love coming. I want to thank the committee. Some of you I've met for the first time not on Zoom, um, and it's really wonderful to see so many supporters here. I want to thank the family, our Yasui West Coast family from Barb and Homer up in Seattle, all the way down the coast, have really worked hard in keeping Min's story alive over the years. Um, most of all, I want to thank you all for remembering Holly and the role she played. This was her life's work, and I know how much um, these celebrations, these contests, um, all meant to her. And the fact that you're keeping it going, you're keeping Holly going. Min died in 1986, so why the heck are we still talking about him? Because now, more than ever, you heard Peggy. His life's lessons, his legacy, have relevance, and they need, the story needs retold. The players in the story may change, but the principles for which Min fought throughout his life are exactly the same. Human rights, civil rights, social justice, they're not just for a few, but they're for everyone who calls this country home. He never saw his battle for Japanese American injustice as just a Japanese American issue. Rather, he attacked that as a constitutional issue, a breach of American law that affects all of us. He was moved to action by the very simple belief that Basic human rights are inalienable, and they deserve equal protection regardless of race or creed or national origin. Men left that jail cell in Multnomah County, the barbed wire imprisonment of Minidoka internment camp. And when he was finally offered release from that hellish place, he delayed his departure. Instead, he stayed on a little longer to help other internees, other prisoners, organize their next steps as they faced release into a hostile America and all the legal challenges that would await them. Finally, Min did leave and he headed to Denver where much of the family had resettled. But his past came with him. And in spite of scoring the highest scores that year on the Colorado bar exam, he was denied a license to practice law in Colorado because of his past arrest and conviction. 
once again, men fought, this time challenging the Colorado Supreme Court to obtain the right to practice law. Another battle fought, another battle won, and men was ready to get into action. The 1940s, we saw the birth of the civil rights mo movement, and men, of course, was in the thick of it. Various mayors in Denver and community leaders recognized the passion of this young lawyer and recruited him to start serving on several advisory councils and committees for the city. It eventually took him to the helm of the city's commission on community relations and human rights. Who better than a man who had been villainized, arrested, and imprisoned on a human rights issue? Min did some of his most important work on that commission, focusing not only on civil rights, but also on developing service for marginalized communities, the elderly, the disabled, youth, and ex-offenders. He worked for decades with the Denver Public Schools, pushing tirelessly for education, equity, and opportunity for minority students. And he dedicated himself to improving community relationships between law enforcement and communities of color. And all this sounds frustratingly familiar to us today. Min's work consumed his energy, but it also fed his energy. He, were, he had the role of executive director for the commission. He was a founding father and officer in the Urban League of Colorado, fighting for economic and social justice for the African-American community. He worked on the establishment of La Raza, the Latin American Research and Service Agency for Colorado, and he developed the Denver Native Americans United. He was chairman of the board for Employ X, a program that helped ex-offenders reintegrate into society. And he also worked in partnership, very close partnership with the Anti-Defamation League and served on the Denver's Interfaith Forum and the Mayor's Task Force on Refugee Affairs. All this while continuing to play a pivotal role in both local and national Japanese American Citizens League, endlessly working towards the issue of redress for the constitutional injustices of World War II. You see a theme here? a theme in this man's life, he had a singular focus that crossed so many lines, so many barriers, a foot in so many communities. In addition to all those fancy titles, my cousins used to tell stories of him driving them to school, showing up at their plays, their school activities, making a mean dish of sukiyaki, and hiking throughout the beautiful Colorado mountains with his three beloved daughters. He called his daughters his garden, Holly, Laurel, and Iris. But he also served as a Boy Scout leader and published a Japanese-American newspaper out of the family's basement with a hand-cranked printer that Holly said she often was in charge of. His wife, Auntie True, also noted that Min served on as many as 75 committees and boards while working for the city of Denver. Talk about making you feel like a slacker when you live in Denver and try to do some of the kind of work that Min did. But his work also extended past Colorado. He spent years on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and as a member of the International Human Rights Association. Min has been honored by the city of Denver with a legal inn of court in his name and a government building in his name. There's also a bust of Min in downtown Denver and a community volunteer award that memorializes his legendary volunteerism during his 40 years of work for our city. But he knew he wasn't a one-man show. Rather, he was very much inspired and invigorated 
by other civil and human rights advocates throughout Denver's diverse communities. And today we bandy around the terms equity, diversity, inclusivity, but those who fought for those ideals in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s did so risking life and limb. Men worked alongside those community heroes, fighting for access to good schools, safe neighborhoods, for decent paying jobs and opportunity. They were fighting for the American dream. Denied to some, clearly deserved by all. When the country erupted with fiery street riots in the 1960s, particularly after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., men was side by side with the community leaders in Denver, in the streets of Denver, helping calm the crowds, negotiating between police and protesters, helping Denver avoid the explosion of violent protests that rocked so many other major American cities. Literally, he was walking the walk. Whether black, American Indian, Muslim, Asian, Latino, we've all had the experience of being the other. Sadly, we share a familiarity with each other's scarred history. History forms us, and it also informs us, but it's nothing more than a dusty book on the shelves unless we act on the lessons learned and use it to mold a better future. Sometimes history asks us to take a stand that demands great personal sacrifice, forcing us into the spotlight of controversy, knowingly heading towards scorn and rejection. But it's the brave few who do so in spite of the consequences. And men did just that. Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Men stood up in the 1940s for the Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans, but he also stood up in the 1940s through the 1980s for the people of Colorado, for the people of Denver, during times of challenge and controversy. We remember on this wonderful Minyasui day that these battles are not done and we must never stop fighting the good fight. We stand on the shoulder of men and women like Minyasui and we remember them. But men would be rolling his eyes if all we did was honor his memory without action. He would admonish us to not just remember his contribution, but to get out there ourselves and make change happen. Men did just that, and that's why 37 years later we're still talking about him. Author Ursula Le Guin said, it doesn't take a thousand men to open a door, but it may to keep it open. Men and so many others fought hard to push open closed doors. Let's help keep them open and perhaps push open a few more. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. We're truly grateful for you traveling from Denver to join us today to shed more light on men's work and legacy. It is clear to see that much of what men accomplished in his lifetime took place in Denver. His legacy endures and continues to inspire generations to come. Now I'd like to invite our special panel of speakers to join us up front to share their thoughts on men's legacy and relevancy to them across generations. And well, they bring a call to action. Our first panelist, Jessica Asai, is a Yonsei, fourth-generation Japanese-American, raised in Hood River, Oregon, 
Since 2010, she has used her law degree to address civil rights compliance at Oregon Health and Science University, where she conducts internal civil rights investigations and provides advice and training on civil rights, equity, and Title IX issues. She was the Minidoka Civil Liberties Symposium speaker for 2020. Please welcome Jessica Asai. Hello, and thank you for having me here today. Um, the remarks I'm sharing are my own. I just want to clarify that. They don't belong to my employer. They're not endorsed by my employer, employer necessarily. Um, I do find that there's a lot we can learn from men and his fight for justice, lessons that are important for me and any social justice or civil rights advocate, and lessons that we can turn into action. The first is conviction. During World War II, the US government took a series of actions after Pearl Harbor the targeted people of Japanese ancestry, including thousands of American-born citizens. And to put it in context, if you think about it, if I was alive in 1941, 1942, I would have been rounded up and incarcerated, and many of the people in this room would be too, even though I was born here in the United States. Actually, I was born in Portland, Oregon. Um, and so when that happened, that included the rounding up and arrest of Japanese business leaders, such as Min's father, Masuo, a curfew, the freezing of assets, and as I mentioned, the eventual incarceration. Within, and that was within an exclusion zone that included most of Oregon, but not part of Eastern Oregon. And their crime was only being Japanese. There was no due process, no notice or right to be heard to respond to the crimes that they were accused of. And men believe deeply in America and the values that our country is supposed to stand for, including democracy, and the right to be free from judgment on the basis of race, color, or ethnicity. So on March 28, 1942, at age 25, he walked out into the Portland night in defiance of the curfew so that he would be arrested. And that led to his imprisonment and his challenge to how our government was treating him, his family, and his community. His strong belief, his conviction in what was right and just is what led him to risk his own freedom so he could prove the government's actions were wrong. And this highlights a second lesson, perseverance. He held onto those ideals and that truth for over 40 years, from his arrest in 1942 to 1983, when he filed a quorum nobis petition to vacate his wrongful conviction. The writ of quorum nobis is a legal tool that allows a court to vacate a judgment when new evidence is found. In Min's case, a researcher found evidence in the 1980s that the government lied and there was no basis for the curfew against Japanese or the incarceration of them. And that led to a court vacating his judgment in 1984. But even then, he was not satisfied because the court had not ruled on his allegations of government misconduct. And he fought that battle until he died in 1986. And then his legal team continued the fight for him. So he persevered until the end of his life. And it was because he believed in the rule of law and civil rights that he fought for so long to make things right. And he didn't do that for glory or fame. He did it because it was the right thing to do, as, as you've heard many people attest to today. And I think the lesson, another lesson there is something to consider is that the fact that the Quorum Nobis writ exists, even if seldom used, speaks to the fallibility of our American justice system. It's a formal acknowledgment that our system of justice isn't perfect, that our government isn't perfect, and creates a mechanism to right a wrong. Min knew this and kept fighting. He persevered, and his pursuit highlights that justice may not arrive quickly, but that shouldn't stop us from fighting for the right result. Another lesson I think you can take away from men is the importance of being an ally, as we heard Dr. Gasui discuss earlier. A few years back, I was asked to assist a team of people who were creating a nomination packet to nominate men for the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And my role in that project was to read through letter upon letter of from individuals and organizations who supported men who also thought he deserved this medal, which, if you're not aware, is our nation's highest civilian honor, and he did receive from President Barack Obama posthumously. I think, you know, I didn't know much about men, honestly, other than kind of his legal background as an attorney. My family grew up with his family. Um, he passed away when I was very young. I never knew him. Um, but what I learned from those letters was his allyship, his bridge building, and his cross-cultural work. And through his fight for his justice, he stood up for the promise that our nation says we give to everyone equality under the law. 
And that conviction informed not just his own fight for justice, but to lead the civil liberties and human rights work that Dr. Yasui talked about in Denver. And that was for everyone, not just Japanese Americans or Asians. And so for decades, he played a key role in Denver's social fabric to ensure other marginalized people were not likewise forgotten in the promise of America. And he was an ally decades before that term became popular because he saw that justice for some did not equal justice for all, that what can be done to least of us could be done to all of us. And so he worked to ensure others had a seat at the table rather than simply being on the menu. For me, his allyship is a call to action that I too should speak up in my personal life when others are being marginalized. For example, when I hear someone voice a stereotype or a slur, I speak up. And it's not easy or comfortable, but it's valuable. And I actually did that this week because on Nextdoor someone used a term oriental, which they didn't mean to be offensive, but someone else had commented that that's not appropriate. And I viewed that as an opportunity to educate and I shared some information about that term and why it's outdated. The fourth lesson I see is life in his life and his work is a bit more personal. You know, he was a Japanese American lawyer in pre-war America. Culturally, he was part of an ethnic group that did not focus on individuality and valued sameness and not making waves. This is most obvious in the Japanese proverb, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And he was a lawyer, which, in my humble opinion, is a profession that often values sameness and conformity. One can only imagine that it was even more homogeneous in the late 1930s when he became the first Japanese American licensed to practice law in Oregon. Yet despite his cultural and professional background, he defied the government. He chose to become a nail that sticks out and risked getting hammered down, not just by his nation, but by his own family and community. And I do understand there, was, there, there were people within the Japanese American community at the time that didn't support what he was doing. And as a fellow Japanese American lawyer, the idea of risking so much gives me great anxiety. So for those that know me, they know I'm not a mousy person, and I'm much more outspoken than most of my family. At the same time, I understand speaking truth to power, as men did, means taking a risk that you will not be well received or understood by people who have the ability to hammer you down. And so when he risked his freedom, there was no way for him to know what might come of his actions. All he knew was that he was making that one ripple in history, and I think that is something we can all learn from, that taking a risk can have the power to change so much. Um, thank you for letting me speak. I especially want to thank the Yasui family, especially Holly, for letting me share men's legacy with others, and um, which I've done a few times, and I, I very much appreciate the ability to share that information with others. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Our next panelist is also a Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese American and works as a public defender in Portland. He was the first Minoru Yasui fellow at the University of Oregon School of Law. His passion is inspired by a desire to hold the state accountable, stemming from his ancestors' unjust incarceration during World War II. He advocates for the marginalized communities and fights against systemic injustices in the criminal justice system. Please welcome Weston Koyama. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and fellow advocates for justice, thank you for joining us today as we gather to celebrate the life and legacy of Minori Asui, a trailblazing civil rights leader who fought tirelessly against racism and prejudice. As a public defender in Oregon, I'm honored to stand before you and reflect on the profound impact of Mr. Yasui's work. You know, I'm struck by Mr. Yasui's words that we owe our progenitors a duty to leave society a better place after we depart this world. In paraphrasing Mr. Yasui, I want to resist the temptation here to make Mr. Yasui into some sort of prophet or saint. I think it's important to acknowledge that Mr. Yasui was a human being like you and me. And I think that if we succumb to the temptation to believe that the injustices of the world can only be challenged and corrected by the proverbial giants of history, we do a serious harm to Mr. Yasui's legacy. 
We should acknowledge that what makes Mr. Yasui extraordinary is his plain spoken humility, coupled with a determination to never give up. That capacity, that capacity exists within us all, a capacity for courage. And if that capacity does not exist within all people, if it is true that we must rely on the giants of history to solve all our problems, then I'd put it to you that Mr. Yasui's nine months in solitary confinement were in vain. And uh, I believe it was referenced earlier, he did spend nine months in solitary confinement after his arrest. Um, you know, I, I won't bore you with all the science. I can tell you that every public defender I know is well aware of the scientific literature that confirms that solitary confinement destroys the human psyche. It's a form of torture. And we're rightfully inspired by Mr. Yasui's resilience um, and his uh, willingness to continue to fight the evils of racism and bigotry despite that torture. But we should not think that our personal struggles are any less worthy of praise. We all fight our own battles to stand up and speak out against injustice in society. And at times we fall short too. Take my great grandfather, Kei Koyama. He immigrated to Portland in 1915 and the FBI arrested him on the day of the attack of Pearl Harbor, 1941, December 7th, 1941, because of his leadership standing in the community. And under FBI interrogation and the not so subtle threat of never seeing his family again, he did name names and undoubtedly made the lives of some of his community members more difficult. Should I believe myself of inferior lineage because my ancestors succumbed to the government's threats? I don't think so. We can and we should celebrate Mr. Yasui for his courage without losing sight of the fact that courage manifests itself in different ways. You know, my great grandfather, he stepped out of a theater not too far from here on the night of December 7th, 1941, where the FBI jumped on him, apprehended him, put him in a windowless car, and drove him to the wilderness of Montana. And his wife and kids, they didn't know what happened to their dad. They had no idea why he disappeared until a few days before Christmas. You know, my great grandfather, he was shuttled from FBI interrogation site to FBI interrogation site all over the country. And his family was eventually forced to the camp at Minidoka, Idaho. And Mr. Asui is rightfully celebrated as a model of what courage can look like in the public eye. But don't tell me for a moment that my ancestors did not have courage. And in reading the government's own account of what they did to my family, what they did to my great grandfather, I have every reason to believe that he would have sacrificed his life for the family he loved. Courage can manifest in other ways too. Sometimes courage can be very dramatic, like you know, a dramatic courtroom argument to suppress evidence illegally seized by the police. And sometimes courage can be as simple as looking a client in the eye and telling her, I'm sorry, but I've done everything I can do. And likewise, when a client looks you in the eye and says, I understand you'll fight for me, but I have no fight left. Indeed, that client was once me back in 2013, sitting on a hospital bed across from my public defender and telling him I did not have the strength to fight my civil commitment. But courage is also contagious. And by remembering Mr. Yasui and his courage, we remind ourselves that the ability to stand up for justice exists in everyone. I'll leave you where I started. Let us not succumb to the temptation that history is written by giants. If we succumb to the temptation that only an elite few can make a meaningful difference, the Mr. Minoru Yasui's nine months in solitary confinement, nine months of torture would be in vain. Let us instead remember that we are all making history every single day in everything that we do, and that the capacity for courage is found in all people. That's all I've got, thank you. Thank you, Weston. 
The third and final panelist is a second year law student at the University of Oregon Law School and also a recipient of the Minoru Yasui Fellowship. Born and raised by a Japanese immigrant mother in Oregon, she is passionate about the issues of cultural competency and minority representation and is planning to pursue a legal career accordingly. Please welcome Anna Rutan. Sorry, give me one second. Weston really got me. <laughs> um, my name is Anna. I'm the Minori Yasui Fellow for the second year running here at the University of Oregon School of Law. This fellowship was established graciously by Bill and Marie Waterman uh, several years ago, and part of the purpose of the fellowship is to honor Minori Yasui, share his story, and continue his legacy. This fellowship opportunity was so exciting to me because, as some of you might share this sentiment, I was never able to actually meet uh, Mr. Minoru Yasui. I was just born a little too late to have had the opportunity to cross paths with him, but his fight and his work to advance not only Japanese American rights, but civil rights broadly, has brought me where I am today, and for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Even though we are a generation apart, his legacy lives on through his work and his loved ones, and as a result of that, it impacts people like me every day. I'm the first generation of my family to be born here, and as a result of that, have grown up surrounded by a multitude of different and often other communities. And now, as a law student, I still find myself tuned into the dynamics of identity and specifically the need to continue the fight that Minoru Yasui fought all those years ago. We aren't done yet, and even though I never met him, I feel impassioned by his dedication and persistence and want to pursue the same justice and equality that he fought for in today's era. I think we can all find ways in our own lives, in our own passions, in our own careers to honor these values. And in today's climate more than ever, Minori Yasui's legacy is important to hold on to as a reminder of where to go from here. Minori Yasui represents someone who has paved the way for others, since we're in Portland, a trailblazer, if you will. And to have the opportunity to continue along that path that has been created for me and for others is a gift I'm incredibly grateful for. I can't wait to be a lawyer with inspiration like Minori Yasui. It's inspiring to share this day with so many others, both friends and loved ones of Minori, and those like me who are inspired to seek and continue the fight for justice and uphold the values represented by Minori Yasui. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I believe we have time for a few questions for the panelists, so Lynn has a microphone if anybody has a question. Anyone, anyone? Thank you guys so much. You don't know how proud that man would be of you. Um, the University of Oregon in general has meant so much to all of us who care about men's story because they keep the principles alive. And you guys are all representing that. Question I have for you all, in the field of law or otherwise, how do we continue to make sure that whether people are going into civil rights law or constitutional law, any field of law that we often associate with men's lessons, how else do we keep this as an important lesson for young lawyers and keep this as part of our education tradition in the study of law? Just would love your thoughts on how this has relevance to other young legal students and scholars. I think that when we teach about the law, we need to impress on law students that they can make a difference, that their voice matters, and that whatever they do in the courtroom or outside the courtroom has an impact. So what I, t I, I teach at Portland Community College, I teach paralegals, and a lot of them are like, well, you know, I can't advise, you know, I'm not a lawyer, you know, I, I don't know what difference I can make. And I tell my paralegal students, you know, you can make a difference. When you see a lawyer who is treating a client poorly because of their race, because of their ethnicity, you should speak up. And you can speak up. And 
you know, maybe that's not going to make the headlines, um, but it does make a difference. And I do think that a lot of paralegals, um, you know, after they take a class with me, they, they feel like, oh, I actually can make a difference. Um, and then, you know, some of them are like, maybe I should go to law school. And I'm like, yes, you absolutely should go to law school. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't preclude, you know, um, you know, furthering your education, finding ways that you can, you know, go into a profession where you, where you can make the difference you want to make. Another question? Oh, another comment, yeah. Oh no, that was amazing. I don't wanna go after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a lawyer yet, so I'll pass. <laughs> if anyone has a th thought to share or a question. Got a couple now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm a retired anthropologist. I taught at Lewis and Clark, and I taught a course called The Anthropology of Violence. Um, and in that course, I spent maybe two weeks on the internment camp experience in the Pacific War. I'm a Japan anthropologist, and I focus on um, issues of gender and inequality in Japan, specifically the occupation of Okinawa by both Japan and the United States. Um, so that course was very important in introducing to students um, at Lewis and Clark about what happened here um, in the United States with Japanese Americans because a lot of students, and this is over the past 20 years, really didn't know. They didn't have the education in schools. So it was important that they were introduced to that. Um, unfortunately, the institution did not allow me to teach a standalone course on it, which I had developed at Earlham College before I came to Lewis and Clark. Um, and the reason why I developed that course is when I was in the archives of the library at Earlham College, um, I discovered that 24 students from the camps were invited to go to Earlham, I see that some of you know that, um, and were able to get their education at Earlham College rather than spend those four years in the camps. Um, and from that information, I decided to create this course, and so I had to study about the internment camp myself, because. I'm Japanese, my mother's Japanese, like, uh, like Anna's mom, but I was born in Japan and then raised here. So I don't have the history that, that many of you have of the internment experience, but I thought it was really important that having come across this archive at Earlham, that when I went on to teach and got the position elsewhere, that I would want to teach that information. So I just wanted to say that it's important to become attorneys, but it's also important to become teachers. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that there are many other teachers in this room who probably teach it in the schools, and I just wanted to give a shout out to those teachers, and I've met them. Thank you. I think we had one more. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas from Oregon Law. Sounds like Mr. Yasui was really good at building client relations. So did you glean any tips about developing a practice from him? Uh, I, I, don't, I, I think I'm the only panelist here who deals with individual people clients. I, I'm, you're, you work for OHSU, so um, I'll, I guess I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, I would say that meeting clients where they're at is probably the most important lesson that I can derive from Minyasui in my day-to-day -day work. My clients come from so many different backgrounds, so many different educational levels, and are really struggling. And sometimes I think one of the challenges I face in my work is you know, I'll be meeting with a client, we don't see eye to eye per se, um, and you know, there's only so much I can do for any given client. Um, and you know, that client can be difficult. You know, they can attack me, they can attack me for any number of reasons, including because of who I am. And um, that may seem odd to some people in the room, but in fact, you know, I, I would put it to you that our criminal justice system is currently formulated is unimaginably coercive and unimaginably uh, oppressive and unimaginably arbitrary. 
And within that context, you know, I am the face of that system for my client. Um, so it's understandable that they lash out at me. And, you know, not taking it personally and meeting that client where they're at and saying, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm on your side. I try to do everything I can to get the best result we can. And understanding that they have a history of trauma, a history that I will never be able to understand 100%, um, and just respecting where we're at with that. Um, but, you know, when, when you're working with clients, you're always trying to meet the client where they're at um, and understand that they're coming at it from a very different place, um, often informed by extraordinary trauma. Let's have a round of applause for our panelists, please. Okay, now that we've heard about men's generational relevancy and calls to action, we've come to Behind These Bars, the long-awaited official dedication of Minoru Yasui's jail cell. A four-year project, plus another delay of a year and a half for this dedication. We're here to share the story behind these bars, the remarkable journey of the actual jail cell where men spent nine months in solitary confinement and its discovery and relocation to the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. And it all began with a single idea. Here and now, what one might consider ground zero is the person whose idea set everything in motion, the Honorable Nan Waller, Multnomah County Circuit Court Judge and recipient of the 27th Annual William H. Wenquist Award for Judicial Excellence, please welcome the Honorable Nan Waller. Thank you all. I'm, I am humbled to be any part of today's uh, event honoring the life and work of Minya Asui. Given how small my role was, I was a connector in the journey of the uh, cell from the Multnomah County Courthouse to its current beautiful location. It really all started in 2016 when Peggy Nagai uh, came to the annual judicial conference and presented um, on Min Yasui's life. And her presentation was called uh, Lessons from Yasui versus United States, the critical role of judges to ensure justice. I have been a circuit court judge for many years. I'm a fifth generation Oregonian. I'm a graduate of the University of Oregon School of Law. And yet, while I knew of Executive Order 9066 and the injustices it authorized, I had never heard Minya Sui's story before Peggy shared it with all of the judges in Oregon. I had never known of a fellow U of O grad and lawyer whose convictions and bravery led him to, un to unjustly serving a nine month sentence in the courthouse in which I served every day. I didn't know of the cell on the seventh floor that was no longer being used where he sat in solitary confinement, trying to write his thoughts to keep his soul alive during those long nine months. I didn't know that it was simply taking a step down Broadway that led to his monumentous ripple of effects throughout this country. I love the part of the story that he literally after eight o'clock one night, strode bravely down Broadway. And to his dismay, he wasn't arrested. In fact, he confronted a police officer and said, arrest me. And nothing happened. He was told to go home. He finally went to Central Precinct and said, here I am. Arrest me. Because he believed so strongly in challenging the unjust executive order. At that point, he was arrested. I did not know until Peggy awakened me how the rule of law that I have great confidence and trust in, although it is challenged at times, had absolutely failed Minya Sui. 
I did not know of his lifelong commitment to right that wrong and of his unbending conviction to never allow such a terrible injustice that undermined the principles of our democracy to happen again. And I am so grateful to have been here today because I got to hear the Denver part of his story. So thank you. Since that day, I have tried very hard to educate myself. I had the privilege of getting to know Jar George um, Nataka. We brought him to the courthouse where he talked about uh, his internment with uh, the Yosui family at Camp Min Minidoka. I had got to go out to lunch with him, and he showed me the award that he'd gotten from Japan and shared the story of what happened so many years ago. I realized that there were so many cross connections with Min Yasui that I'd never recognized. And this morning, I thought, oh my goodness, I have my father's University of Oregon yearbooks. And I went and I found it, and there was Min Yasui's name and picture, and my father's. So the connections and the ability of a man to simply decide to take a stroll down a street changed the world, and we should never forget that. When Peggy Nagai mentioned in uh, her judicial conference presentation that uh, Min Yasui's family wanted to see the cell where he'd lived for nine months in our courthouse, it seemed to me the least that I could do to try to make that happen. At the time, there was an urgency in setting up that visit because the county was in process of selling the courthouse uh, as we were building a new safer courthouse uh, that we are now occupying. With the help of Holly Yasui's description of the cell given to her by her father, arrangements were made for Holly, Peggy, Lynn, and others to see the cell. The thing that immediately struck me as I stood in that cell was the cruelty that had to have gone into the decision of which cell he was going to spend his nine months in. It was the only cell that you could not see the sky from. Standing in the small, dark cell, the strength of his convictions was overwhelming, and the need to assure that his story would be immortalized was apparent. Acting again as a connector, I put Peggy and Holly in contact with Chair Kapori's office, and the plan to preserve the cell began. I am very grateful today to be here as a judge and as an Oregonian and as a University of Oregon graduate to be able to express my gratitude for the work done to assure that Minya Sui's story will never be lost. Given all of the events of recent years, the con its continuing relevance is powerful and it is necessary reminder of the failability of the justice system if we are not vigilant. As an Oregonian, I'm grateful that we have a day dedicated to remember and acknowledging Min Yasui and his story. As a University of Oregon graduate, I want to thank the university, the Watermans, the Yasui Fellows for your dedication to carrying Min Yasui's legacy forward. It is imperative that we, none of us ever forget the story and that we carry it on generation to generation in Oregon and in every other state. Your commitment of everyone in this room to uh, continuing uh, this work uh, will assure that it is never forgotten. As a judge, the story of Minyasui has made a great deal of difference to me in how I view the world, in how I view our community, in how I view Southwest Broadway when I walk down it, and I think of that simple act of walking down the street and what the impact was. So I want to thank everyone who made it possible. I, I had the great opportunity to meet some of the Yasui family last spring um, when the cell was in the museum, and it is beautiful. And to see the Medal of Freedom hanging in it is remarkable. You had a remarkable family member. Your family were so gracious and welcoming. And I thank all of you for
carrying this on. I, I hope that we will all continue to spread the word and that I hope uh, that when this comes around that each person in this room will tell 20 other people and that we will have a, a convention center full of people listening. I would hope that we would have the expo center where uh, I went out to look at the expo center after listening to George describe the smells and the look of what was out there. And I realized I'd never seen, despite going out there for plant sales and other things, I'd never seen the arches with all of the tags, each representing an individual. I'd never listened to the beautiful song of all of those tags tinkling together. And so I urge everyone to carry on. Thank you, and thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this incredible event honoring a remarkable person. And I agree, it doesn't take giants. It just takes a step and sometimes a small journey down a strip, trip street to make a difference. Thank you. I love the comment, um, Judge Waller, when you said that you were just a connector. But I think being a connector is so key, just like standing up when you hear a wrongdoing or, or standing up uh, and being a voice. Um, I remember in 9-11 when the Muslim community was really nervous and scared and they were looking to the Japanese-American community about their fears. And, and I just think we have to be connectors for each other and support each other. Um, as Judge Waller explained, Peggy knew just the person to contact who had the wherewithal and conviction or was just crazy enough to take this one on. Peggy immediately reached out to Lynn Fujikami Parks, then Executive Director of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. Here to explain herself is Lynn Fujikami Parks. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kristen, and um, good afternoon, everyone. And I do just want to, oh my gosh, thank um, all of the participants today. I've just been so moved and inspired by your words and what you've shared. So just want to give everybody another round of applause. So when, when Peggy reached out with Nan's idea to save the cell from what certainly was going to be demolition, um, it really was a no-brainer. I immediately agreed and said, yes, um, of course we would take this on. Um, and yes, somewhere I heard that part of this discussion was who's crazy enough to take this on. Um, so that's where the explaining yourself part comes in. Because um, I was basically saying yes to something that we had no idea how to actually execute. And furthermore, we had no place to move the cell to at the time because we hadn't yet found a location for the new museum. Um, but minor details, right? Um, needless to say, I did have some explaining to do uh, to sell this idea to our board. Um, but luckily, they all felt, um, as I did, uh, that this was something we just absolutely had to do. Say yes and then figure out a way to do it and how to pay for it. Um, if nothing else, we could always store it in Connie's uh, garage. So <laughs> for, for those of you to who don't know who Connie Masoka is, she is our fearless leader. She's the president of our board of directors. Um, but anyway, this, this was basically pure, unwavering belief, uh, determination, and conviction, just, just like men. So this really did set the wheels into motion um, of what was to become an epic four-year project. Um, and I, I hope that we have captured uh, this in the cell ded dedication video that you're about to see. So thank you, Nan, for really being the catalyst. Thank you, Peggy, uh, for reaching out to us. And we are just so indebted to the many, many people that were involved in this project. So please pay attention to the credits at the end of the video, because none of this would have been possible without, you know, 
say it takes a village. It really did take a lot of people to see this project come to fruition. We, we just kept moving one foot forward in front of the other, and we never looked back. Um, here is that journey, and we dedicate this to Min Yasui, to Holly Yasui, who actually had started working on this dedication with her when she had passed, um, and to um, Min's brother, Homer Yasui. Homer, I know you're with us today and watching, um, so I just wanted to say hello. We miss you, um, and we dedicate this as well to you. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy this, this dedication video. Greetings, and welcome to Behind These Bars, the official dedication of Minoru Yasui's historic jail cell, which was removed from the old Multnomah County Jail to become the centerpiece of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. My name is Lynn Fujigami Parks, and I'm the retired executive director of the museum. We are here today to dedicate the jail cell in honor of Minoru Yasui and his daughter, Holly Yasui. Together, they have left a legacy as fearless champions in the fight for equality and justice, never missing an opportunity to speak out to defend civil rights and to advance social justice. The cell memorializes and pays tribute to the extraordinary man behind these bars. This is the actual jail cell that held Minoru Yasui in solitary confinement for nine months as he purposely violated the military curfew imposed on people of Japanese ancestry to test its constitutionality. Its very existence would never have been known had it not been for Holly discovering its location through her father's detailed writings and interviews. Min's prolific writing included his thoughts and poetry that he wrote during his incarceration and will be shared throughout this program as enacted by Heath Hewn. Interminable night. It's 9.30 now, and thus commences our night. The long and endless interminable night. Within this hopeless place of the condemned and the damned. All in! The bellowed command of screws on their rounds reverberate hollowly through prison corridors with a steel-throated rumble and the metallic smash of steel on steel, iron-barred gates slam shut on clanging cell doors. The lights dim out. New fish in the tanks, fresh from the streets, still bewildered and resentful, are reluctant to sleep. Old-time jailbirds in blankets complacently wrapped are fitfully seeking rest in filthy canvas-lined bunks. There's desultory talk, speculations as to what the sentence will be, conjecture of how best to beat the rap, lamentations loud in injured tones of being framed on, on a damn dirty deal. According to the talk, how innocent we all are. There are intermittent sounds. Sound of shoes dropping to the floor. Sound of flaring tempers. A, a short, vicious fight. Obscene jokes. Some indecent stories. Big-winded braggery. Ribald laughter. Lurid profanities. Loud bursts of argument. All the mumble and grumble of imprisoned men. God damn it, dummy up! The kangaroo judge angrily yells to his darkened court. Conversations lag. The muttering talk dies down, and soon the nerve-rasping rattle of ungodly snores, occasionally the explosive boom of a sneeze, Strangled coughing, restless talking, 
a hoarse, noisy whisper, a, a defiant curse. These are the sounds in the night of a hundred lost men who are locked in a cage and are going to sleep. The hours drag on slowly. A far off clock strikes the midnight hour. Sudden, there's the piercing shriek of a conscious tortured wretch protesting and screaming in soul anguished remorse. What awe shaking ghosts haunting him tonight. Seeming eons later, the maddening gibberish, the shuddering groans, wildly undulates from the madman throne in the hole. Booze soaked winos and dehorns set up a liquor crazed clamor and swell the insane pandemonium of noise. There's the whimpering cry of some youthful miscreant sleeping in an isolation cell along Juvenile Row. Grim shadows on the walls, crazily distorted in the devilish light. Remind in fiendish designs the ever-confining bars. Muffled footsteps of screws on their rounds. A scampering cockroach pauses and leers down at me and moving freely about slips through the bars. An awful mockery. Night brings sleep to hundreds of men. Sleep, yes, but a troubled sleep that brings no peace. And so passes the hours, the horrors, the night in this hopeless place of the condemned and the damned. As you will hear shortly, the man behind these bars and the injustice that inspired his acts of courage served as the impetus to save the cell. It all began with the Honorable Nan Waller, at that time presiding judge of Multnomah County Circuit Court, who had the idea to preserve the cell. Inspired by Min's legacy, she knew that the building that housed the courthouse and jail was going up for sale. She reached out to share the idea with Peggy Nagai, Min's lead attorney for his Coram Nobis case, wondering whom to contact to take on such an endeavor. Here to share more on Min's life and what the jail cell represents is Peggy Nagai. Recently, I spoke to junior history classes at Argonne High School in San Mateo, California. Students asked questions about World War II, Minusui's case, redress, and the relevancy today of what happened over 80 years ago. Their questions were insightful and thought-provoking. I answered with the best that I could give them and with my invitation and edict about their role and responsibility in furthering justice and building a multiracial inclusive democracy in the U.S., a true democracy that we have yet to experience. This jail cell represents what one person did to stand up for constitutional rights. It represents the willingness to put both personal liberty and professional achievement on the line and that one person made a difference for 120,000 others, as well as for all Americans, by stepping forward and intentionally violating a federal law and telling the government it was wrong. This cell also is a physical representation of the very best of the US, where people take their citizenship responsibilities seriously and believe that it's up to each of us to speak up and not to say that someone else can do that, or I'm not strong enough, or I'm fearful of what might happen. Minoru Yasui said that what is done to the least of us can be done to all of us. I knew we had to protest it. And the it he was referring to was the curfew imposed upon Japanese Americans that violated their due process rights, 
If it was done to Japanese Americans, it could be done to any other group as well. This cell stands as a monument to the action that we must take, especially at this time, where anti-Asian hate is rampant, where books about race or sexual orientation are outright stolen from libraries and banned in schools, where speech about LGBTQ issues in classrooms is illegal, where reproductive rights are no longer the law of the land, where voting rights are in even more jeopardy, where transgender children are refused care for their gender-enhancing surgeries, or African-American reparations is stalled. We must say no to the trampling of civil rights and to turning democracy into an oligarchy, authoritarian government, or apartheid. People can come to JAMO and see the cell, sit in it, hear Yasui's words, and experience the confinement that men experienced over 80 years ago. This cell makes the historical and ethereal relevant and tangible. And it is also a place where people can learn that Min Yasui's legacy is greater than the experience in this cell, his case against the curfew, and his work in Oregon. His full legacy is about working across diverse communities, helping form organizations such as the Urban League of Greater Denver, or work with Latinx, Native Americans, Jews, LGBTQ communities, women, and others to promote cross-cultural social justice. Add to that his work for Japanese American redress. This cell is more at the beginning of his lifelong quest for equity and justice rather than the end of that journey. But it is an incredible way to start a conversation, to ask what people are willing to stand up for, willing to go to jail for, willing to disrupt the status quo for. That is who Minyasui was. That is what he did. He was bold. He spoke his mind. He was not liked by everyone. Why? Because he was bold, spoke his mind, and was willing to do what's right, regardless of the personal cost from a culture that is oftentimes quiet, sometimes worried about what other people think about us, and don't want to make waves or stand up because the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Yasui and this cell stand for the very best of what we can do as Japanese Americans, from our lived experiences of incarceration and or the intergenerational trauma from our relatives' incarceration, we can be at the forefront of speaking out for ourselves and others. This is the importance of Min's jail cell and his legacy. Thank you, Peggy. The decision to save the cell was easy, but the execution of it was not. Answering Peggy's call led to a four-year monumental project to extract, relocate, reconstruct, and preserve what has become one of the museum's most priceless artifacts. Every step of the way, obstacles and challenges had to be overcome. The right people at the right time had to coalesce. One might even say the stars had to align. Beginning with support from the Multnomah County Commissioners, the cell was donated to us and excluded for the eventual sale of the courthouse with a caveat that new owners would be required to work with us for the extraction of the cell. Preservation architects and engineers led by architect developer and museum board member Brian Kimura were consulted to advise on the process as well as determine whether the floor of the new museum would structurally support the weight of the steel. Layers of lead paint had to be stripped from the bars and the cell had to be carefully deconstructed. Only one company in the whole city had the wherewithal and capacity to do the actual extraction and move. And might I add, this was all being done as the country shut down due to the pandemic. Once the cell arrived at the new museum, the work began to put the steel cell back together in space that, mind you, consisted only of drywall. Fortunately for us, we had enlisted the extraordinary talent of artist and sculptor Brian Borello, who was deeply committed to recreating the historic cell in painstakingly authentic detail. Here to share this process is the artist himself, 
Brian Dorello. I was excited about building this sculpture, which I think of as a cubic sculpture uh, for a container for matter and memory, from taking something that was carceral, unpleasant, built for punishment, and turning it into something, a bit of a positive transformation. I was invited to participate in this project by architect Brian Kimura, uh, who I think found my uh, business model fluid enough to get in and out to do the extraction, help with the extraction uh, and the construction on a pretty short timeline. Uh, I was doing global pandemic. Uh, there were some challenges with construction crews, mostly working at night uh, after the crews went home. And um, uh, the initial phase was uh, assessing the material, preparing it for the fitting and the welding. Uh, had to build a superstructure uh, because it basically was a ply wall and stud uh, construction. Um, so uh, what you'll find is that there's a, a, a stamps that indicate that this was a Carnegie steel mills, probably came from the East Coast, probably came from Pittsburgh, uh, probably came by rail and then was transported to the courthouse to the seventh floor um, via horseback and then manual labor to get it up there. So we had to cut it into sections and fit it into a seven foot uh, freight elevator. The construction of it was a little bit complex because it was uh, hardened steel. It was a high carbon steel component and I found that when we would drill into the metal plate to prepare for the welding and the riveting together is that uh, there was actually uh, a layer of mild steel, which we could drill into, and then we hit a layer of high carbon steel, which we couldn't drill through. So I had to bring in the oxyacetylene tanks and do uh, flame cuts through it uh, to prepare for the weld spots. So what I strove for was to try to recreate the cell and recreate the texture and the final finish uh, to really kind of evoke that sense of something that was about incarceration and punishment. And when you stepped into it, you really got the sense of what maybe uh, Yasui-san felt when he was in there, the claustrophobia, the dread, the boredom, uh, all those feelings that you could maybe evoke, that would maybe be evoked in a visitor to the cell itself, right? And that's kind of what, what kind of got me to this concept that I was trying to formulate, which where it straddles artifact and art. Because in and of itself, it's a significant cultural artifact, an object, you know, a man-made object, right? But where it starts to go towards the realm of art is where art is meant to express an idea or something of beauty or some emotional uh, power. And I really felt like as I was building this or recreating this that, uh, that there really was something artistic being done. That this is, you know, like I said, it was kind of a, I thought it was like a minimal cubic sculpture uh, that was going to be a container for matter and memory. And uh, I feel like as it straddles this art and uh, artifact uh, idea, uh, the art comes in when it evokes this powerful emotion. And I think of it as that you know, when the public goes in, there's an element of shared experience. And I think that's what art does. And then to be able to share that over time and through maybe even generations to share the experience of, of uh, Mr. Yasui. So I feel this is a monument to true heroism, to true principled action, and also a testimony to the Japanese American experience that was that time in the 40s, but also represents maybe the way that we can address injustices and systemic injustices that people are still feeling today, people that are undervalued or marginalized, and how we can make that change. Thank you, Brian. We are truly grateful and in awe of the amazing work you did. You were indeed the perfect steward for this task. Visitors are now able to stand in the middle of the cell, view Min's Presidential Medal of Freedom, and hear audio of his voice sharing what it was like to be incarcerated there. It is a powerful artifact that literally speaks to you. Artifacts like this have the power to eternally connect past present and future generations. Here to share his thoughts about the dedication and the power of the physical experience of the cell is Min's only surviving sibling, Homer Yasui. I'm, I think that's a great thing that they're gonna do because here you have a 
three-dimensional object, which is not a thing of beauty, but says something to make people wonder and think, say, hey, this guy and this guy happened to be my brother Minoa, spent nine months in solitary confinement behind these very, very, very same bars. He walked back and forth in this cell, counting the steps to one, to one wall to the other. He sat on this hard bench for days on end. He wondered for the first six weeks whenever they're going to let him get a haircut or cut his fingernails. And I think of all the time he must have sit there writing innumerable letters. Eventually he got a typewriter. And fortunately I have a pack rat sister named Yuka who saved all these letters from me. So we have many, many letters that men wrote in jail. Plus his doggerel, his uh, poetry, if you want. not great poetry, but uh, it, it's, it's interesting because it reflects his feelings while he was sitting there in jail wondering, what am I going to get out of here? So I think this is a graphic three-dimensional object people can relate to. They go inside there, hold on to the bar, say, my God, imagine you're only 26 years old. You're in here for something that was not wrong. It was against the law, but it was not wrong. It was an unjust law. That's what I think. Oh yes, I think that they should reflect upon why this young man was in his jail. Find out why. Uh, they don't know who it was maybe, but unless they know why he was in this jail, it wouldn't have the same effect, I don't think. Well, I think it's, it's important because the history and the Experience, life experiences of the Nikkei in the United States is not very well known, even by our own Nikkei community members. A lot of them don't know much about the history. They may not be interested either, but I think it's important that these things be preserved so that years down the line they can come there and say, oh my goodness, this is what it was like living like my day, my day and before my day. My, my father, my uncle Rennie's these days, what it was like, how tough it must have been, how different it must have been. So reflect upon where they came from, I think is very important. To understand that they, the people who have come from different land have still the same desires and hopes that you do. It's very same thing. It may be manifested a little bit differently. It addresses different, the food is different, all, but in the end, the desires are all the same. Oh, like I said, I want to leave them the, the history of our people, not, not, not just me, but I mean, uh, when I say our people, I mean people of Japanese ancestry who came to the United States, you know, beginning with my father, they was around 1900. And all the difficulty and the vicissitudes and the troubles and the problems they faced and how it took so many years to, like my father comes to this in 1903, a great land of freedom, you know. He didn't have a great land of freedom until 1953 when he got his naturalization paper and that was the culmination of his efforts to become American citizen. Barbara, he applied for American citizenship in 1943. In 1943, he was in an internment camp, and yet this guy wanted to be an American citizen so badly. While he's in an American internment camp, he applied for American citizenship. You know, that's unbelievable. But in 1952, the Walter McCarran Act was passed, and so for many, many, many East States, like my father and my mother, they were finally allowed to become American citizens, and that made them so happy. Because this is a lifetime of working for something like this, and they made it. Oh, they do. Too many people take for granted. They, th they think it's nothing. But not if you were my father or my mother or my uncle. Say, hey, you work a whole lifetime for that, and it's, it's well worth it. Thank you so much, Homer. We honor you today as well along with your beloved wife, Mickey, as founders of our museum and organization. We owe you a debt of gratitude for paving the way and being an inspiration to us throughout the years. And as Homer spoke of the power of experiencing the cell, you are now about to hear music composed using actual sounds from the cell. This truly is the sound of history. Please welcome 
Julian and Amelia from No No Boy. Right at first, of course, they uh, heard the guards and so on very suspicious of me. When we go out to court, they would make sure to handcuff me, which is all right. Uh, handcuff me in front, not in back. Go up in the county jail, it's just a block and a half to court. So we had to go down the elevator, out into the street, walk a block, go up into the court, and go into the courtroom. Before you go in the courtroom, there's an ante room, so they take off your, your handcuffs. They put a chain around your waist, and they lead you. They put shackles on my feet so I couldn't run. But you go clank, 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 clank. locked in 24 hours a day and this is the thing I was complaining about because um, they wouldn't let me out to exercise at all. They surely you walk three steps that way, three steps this way, three steps. It's about eight feet by six feet and it has these uh, canvas bunks, you know. And I guess they gave me a blanket. There's a potty in there and that's all. So all you can do is they used to give us four slices of bread potato. No, it's four slices of bread and uh, your old oatmeal mush. That's for breakfast. Sometimes they had prunes. Huh? It was a treat when they had prunes. And then for lunch, they'd give you a boiled potato and four slices of bread. Starch. All starch. You know, I, I lost weight because the uh, first week or so, I didn't eat that crap. It was a crud. But soon you get so hungry, you will eat it. But if you don't eat the potato, they'll chop it up and make it into something else. And, Eventually. Well, it will keep sustained life. But the Olivers used to come in oh, about once a month or so and bring Chinese food. Boy, I used to really enjoy that. Of course, reading materials he gave me too because the Olivers would bring it in. Toss me something fast and low Dreamt I saw a model plane this morning Flying past the boundary road Doubled off the Buddhist minister Sliding into second to beat the throne Mini Doka Dressed in white Minidoka. I went to Minidoka. Some translucent milk glass moon Mini toker Dressed in white Mini toker I went to Mini toker in the corner side so there's bars on this side bars on this side and steel wall behind you it's two steel walls steel wall on the top and concrete floor on the bottom 
You can't see outside at all. It's,、uh, there are windows down below, so there's light in there. But it's a naked bulb hanging above your cell. During the spring, they had the questionnaire: Do you forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan, and will you serve in the United States Armed Forces?、And、many of the kids were answering no, no. The reason they were answering no is they asked you, Do you forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? You say no because you because you never had allegiance. <coughs> Secondly, the other guys were saying, Gee, why should I fight for the country if they don't give me my rights? So all these no, no boys were being picked up and sent to Tule Lake. Thank you, Amelia and Julian. Min's daughter Holly was looking forward to joining us for the cell dedication, but sadly we lost her to COVID in 2021. We are devastated by this loss, and here to pay tribute to Holly is Chisao Hata, creative director of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. A poem for Holly. On the dawn of El Dio de los Muertos, the ancient ones greeted you. We place ofrendas of golden flor de muertos, incenso, and white chrysanthemums, and osenco, on your altar. We stood back and watched the smoke rise into the light of the day. Cupped in our hands, we offered mandarina and cudamono, pan and mochi. Feeding our ancestors strength to continue on the path of Hustika, we swept the ground to reveal the footsteps you walked as you led us on the road of humanity. You stood with your Okasan and Padre, Obasan and Abuelos. Their courage to survive brought you to this moment. Their lives of sweat. And land nurtured us. Their resilience and hope for their children planted the seeds of our future. Tradition and breaths ebb and flow in synchronicity, like an ocean. Gaia, el aire, fuego, misu, tierra, encircling you. We stand, women. Circulo de mujeres, dancing to the moonlight, la luna, dancing at a bone, dancing to the beat of our open, wounded souls. Women, surrounding you, teaching us about love and survival, holding us while we navigate life, pushing out our lives of joy and pain. Earth and life, in suru and human, our hands linked and rose. Into the sun, flapping into our power, and one by one, we joined, forming another circle, surrounding you, greeting you into a place free of suffering, a home with warmth, food, grace, unconditional love, a circle of global humanity, rising up, conjuring a pulsing glow, holding you above the light. So you will see the glow of our eyes forever. We join you, my sister, in the solar rays, standing with ancestors, dancing in the moonlight, circling our humanity as you light the way for all, child, elder, animal, plant, and beings. So we can see the path of love. So we will see the way ahead of us and beyond us. Forward. Dale karage, gambate, 
together, hand in hand, forward, dale coraje, combate. Nunca te rindas. Never give up. Why are we here? Why are we here was asked of me, and as I looked around to see, I saw a child, age about three. Smiling she was, cute with a dimple, my placid thought, my mood did rimple when she asked that question, so simple. Why can't we go home? It's so near, she asked with a hint of a tear. Even to a child, liberty is dear. To make the foe suffer anew is an aim of war, as men should do. But the women and the children, too? Why must we stay in this awful place? I dared not look on her innocent face. To say, that was because of our race. When men wage war, kindness departs out of their souls and in their hearts, they awaken hatreds with brutal arts. Why are we here? The little girl asked. Officials said army and in smugness basked. But we want real motives now unmasked. Are we the people, though not admitted, punished for crimes by others committed, to live as free men? Are we permitted? Why are we here? Why are we alone, imprisoned, through no fault of our own? Someone else's sins to atone. It must not be so that we might be deprived of our citizens' right to aid in the triumph of freedom's fight. To close, I'd like to share President Barack Obama's words when he posthumously awarded Men's Presidential Medal of Freedom to his family in 2015. Today, Men's legacy has never, never been, been more important. important. It is a call to our national conscience, a reminder of our enduring obligation to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, an America worthy of his sacrifice. We dedicate this cell to Min Yasui, his daughter Holly Yasui, and their lifelong fight for justice and equality. Their life and legacies that are embodied in this cell endure to impart lasting lessons and to inspire generations to come from every background and walk of life. And to share a favorite quote from Min, we are born into this world for a purpose and that is to make it a better place. Min and Holly have indeed done just that. We invite everyone to visit the museum to see the cell that no longer holds the prisoner but holds his Presidential Medal of Freedom. No longer a symbol of incarceration, but a powerful artifact to remind us of men's courage, his fight for civil and human rights, his unwavering love of country and constitution, and of his enduring spirit that could not be broken nor contained behind these bars. Thank you for joining us today. Evacuation. America, magnificent America, with thine principles of justice, liberty, and equality trampled into the dust, with your banners of democracy tarnished with militant racial distrust. How your patriots of yesteryears must cry out in voiceless anguish and protest 
against the arbitrary, tyrannical, dictatorial incarceration of your citizens of the West. America, my America, my native land whose love of liberty engendered men like me and filled them with the unquenchable love of the rights of the free. If freedom is to survive, if democracy of all men is to live again, your high sense of justice and your national self-respect you must regain. journey and an amazing story. I love how the No No Voice uh, incorporates the music of the South just as um, just as we were talking about the Shinto tags and the music that that makes too. I think that's just the beauty that can come from the sacrifice. Um, so to close we'd like to extend our deep gratitude to our guests and speakers and panelists and we thank all of you for joining us today, celebration of Men's Jail South. For those of you who are here in person, you're invited to the Japanese American Museum of Oregon for reception to visit Men's Jail South exhibit, where you'll have the opportunity to meet many of the people that uh, were featured in the video and that were instrumental in this project. The museum is just five blocks away at Northwest 4th in Flanders. There will be a complimentary reception um, although, if you think about it, we'd love to have you become uh, friends of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, or a donation would be, uh, would be wonderful too. Also, right now, in the Japanese American Historical Plaza, the cherry blossoms are in full bloom. Hopefully, it's not pouring rain. Maybe you can check that out as well too, and know that that's also a project uh, that JAMO also works on as well. Um, and... Uh, and you know, finally, we ask you again to join us in our goal to continue the legacy of Min and Holly Yasui to fight racism and discrimination as individuals with groups in your community or with others at the national level. Uh, right now, currently, there is a Lava Ridge um, windmill project that is kind of encroaching on the, um, on the land of Minidoka right now. And I think it's, uh, although... Although we do support sustainable, sustainable energy, and we think that's wonderful, uh, it's very difficult for many people that spend a lot of time working to get that land preserved. Um, and now there are uh, very, very large windmills that are, are going to be either on or very close to that property. So there is also information uh, in a flyer in the back and maybe even a couple people that can answer questions about that. Um, my... Uh, yeah, I just I think just want to thank everybody for for being here. I think by being here, um, it really means something. Your support means everything to I think everybody that's been involved. Uh, what a huge four year plus year and a half journey that the cell has come to be here for. So I hope you can make it to the reception, and we'd like to thank all of you for coming.